Greetings. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the Steve Dace Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. I am Steve Dace. He's Todd Erzin. He's Aaron McIntyre. You are you, and I hope you are happy with that. Coming up on today's show, brought to you by our friends over at First Cup Coffee Company, the Patriot-owned coffee company that has the same core fundamental values of faith, family, and freedom that you do. But that's, that's not really why we talk about them here on the show. It's because they make great coffee. And then it's because... They share the same values that we do. A flavor for every freedom-loving American. The roast dates right there on each and every bag. They ship it to you within days of roasting. If you want to try it or try it again, use my code DACE to get 10% off at firstcup.com. Promo code DACE for 10% off at firstcup.com. And if you end up subscribing because you love it so much, you'll get 10% off every month for the life of your subscription at firstcup.com. Promo code DACE. If it seems like there's a bit of a bounce in my step today, it's because... We are beginning, uh, we did the introduction last week. I got to tell you, I, I got a couple of pastors even that emailed me and said that the introduction you guys did on that for a layman's show was pretty good. So that's a decent start. That's a decent start when the professionals are, are logging in to say, hey, you guys are, that's, that was pretty good. You I, know, I'm sure though that, that that era of good feelings will end quickly. I, I'm sure it will. <laughs> Once we dive into the actual text and start telling people what we might think it means. Yes. Blasphemer! Yes, indeed. But um, um, when we dive into Romans, and we're going to start verse by verse next hour, a couple of things, and I'll say this again next hour, again, just to reset before we start it, uh, but uh, this is very informal. We don't have any of this scripted. We're not planning on trying to get through a chapter a week. Um, We might, in a given week, do that. We might spend an entire week on just one verse. And the conversations that ensue, we want this to be a very organic process. And Aaron, I don't think we've we've remembered to tell you this, but uh, Todd and I were talking about it. We think we're going to maybe every every four or five weeks, we're going to pause from the text. I'm going to collect along the way some of the best or more more interesting or or challenging feedback we've gotten from the audience. And every four or five weeks, we're going to break from the text and go through some of that feedback just to check in. There's wisdom in a multitude of counsel. There's a lot of smart Bible people in the audience or a lot of people that are are going to ask great questions and offer a perspective on, on something that maybe we missed or didn't pick up on. Let's take advantage of that resource, right? For sure. I think it's a great idea. So we will do that about every, should we do it every four or five weeks, do you think? Once a month. Once a month? Yeah. All right. Once a month, we'll do that then. Okay. Once a month, we'll take a break from the text and we'll just find out what you think and we'll respond to that uh, as we go through this book. So since we're doing it this way, very informally, it, it very well may take the rest of our careers to finish this work. Yes. <laughs> okay. But we are going to begin what uh, what I think anyway is the greatest theological treatise ever written in the history of humanity. Uh, we are going to begin it with uh, chapter one, verse one coming up next hour of the show. We're going to have three non-political questions, which I totally forgot about. So I hope, are we ready for that? Ready for what? Exactly. So Aaron, let me know if you've got something or uh, am I, I think my niece is going to be here. So it, it's got to be, uh, she's only nine. Okay. So I think she's going to be here for that. So I, I, I just, I know we're normally a PG-13 show, but this is going to have to be, di- well, let me rephrase that. Original Disney programming, you if you know what I'm saying. ask you what your favorite Disney princesses it, are? It, it might be some yeah, along those okay. lines, yeah. Or we could all three come up with one again. If you want to do it that way, just let us know. Okay. All right. Uh, so we are looking uh, forward to that. Actually, it's the bottom of this hour we're doing that. So yes. So you've yeah. got... A 30 minute warning next hour john daniel davidson over at the federalist is with us because he's got a cool new book out right todd and it's a perfect start to get the book of romans started yeah it, in- i mean it, it's a great segue after the romans conversation we're going to talk about it. it's uh, dealing with the intersection of faith and the culture war in america so we'll get into that as well so before we get into each and every one of those things however let us begin as we always do with aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away what happened while we were away brought to you by gas prices are back in the news the average price of a gallon of gas in the United States has hit its highest level in six months. This comes on the news that the White House has no plans to refill the nearly depleted Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which they drained in order to artificially lower the price of gas. Pete Buttigieg, your thoughts. Let's be clear that uh, the automotive sector is moving toward EVs, and we can't pretend otherwise. Sometimes when these debates happen, I feel like it's the early 2000s, and I'm talking to some people who uh, think that we can just have landline phones forever. Meanwhile, speaking at Stanford, here's Federal Reserve Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, who says interest rate cuts are not to be had for now. Recent readings on both job gains and inflation have come in higher than expected. The economy added in an an average of 265,000 jobs per month. 
uh, in the three years through February, a faster pace than we have seen since last June. And the higher inflation data over January and February were above the low readings in the second half of last year. But these recent data do not, however, materially change the overall picture, which continues to be one of solid growth, a strong but rebalancing labor market, <clears throat> and inflation moving down toward 2% on a sometimes bumpy path. Learning Chinese today. Today's phrase is, is bumpy path the new transient inflation? Meanwhile, in New York City, NYPD arrested eight people at a Bronx home of a group of gun-toting, drug-dealing, illegal alien squatters last week. The NYPD collared the eight suspects after they were called to the Bronx home last Wednesday on a report of a man with a gun. When the officers arrived, they saw a man pointing a pistol at somebody as he stood in the driveway, but the suspect took off when the cops walked up and quickly headed back into the building's basement. Six of those eight arrested in that incident, again, these are armed illegal alien squatters dealing drugs, were released with no bail. In a statement to Fox News, Immigration and Customs Enforcement said that most of the eight Venezuelan illegal alien squatters just mentioned were previously apprehended at the Texas border and were released into the U.S. And one was arrested for murder last summer in Yonkers, New York. And now here's this from the U.K. Daily Mail. Researchers in the Netherlands tracked more than 2,700 children from age 11 to their mid-20s, asking them every three years of feelings about their gender. Results show that at the start of the research, about 1 in 10 children, or 11 percent, expressed gender non-contentedness to varying degrees. But by age 25, the same group of children, just 1 in 25, or 4 percent, said they often or sometimes were disconnected with their gender. The researchers concluded, quote, the results of this current study might help adolescents to realize that it is normal to have have some doubts about one's identity and one's gender identity during this age period, and that this is also relatively common, end quote. Bruce Jenner, your thoughts. Here he is on X reacting to a photograph of a large, muscular man competing in a track event against women. Quote, this is so wrong. How can we allow this to continue? How can men and women, mothers and fathers, stand idly by and allow this to happen to their daughters? We, the people, are fed up. We cannot vote for people, Democrats, that want insanity to persist. Girls are getting hurt. Anyway, Tierra's law just passed in the Colorado State Senate. The law will make it easier for trans criminals to change their name, evade identification, and hide their criminal record. It's named after Tiara, a drag queen, convicted felon, and prostitute. Checking out California's new $20 minimum wage. Here's Fox 26 in Fresno. We had walked up, and those close signs... That was it. 20 employees in Lemoore were let go today because the owner says he could not afford to pay them with that increase. Yeah, Monty, former employees tell me that at first they thought it was an April Fool's joke, but that quickly changed when their boss handed them their final check. And finally, Gavinomics in the case of California and Bidenomics in the case of the rest of the country is hitting the country hard, but some more than others. Late last year, I went very, very viral because I was selling my farts in a jar. And unfortunately, I was hospitalized because I got a little bit overzealous and was producing too many farts and ended up in the emergency room because I thought I was having a heart attack, but it turned out to just be gas pains. So I made about $200,000 selling my farts in the jar, but I was forced into an early retirement. And that's what happened while we were away. The wrath of God has been revealed. That was not real, right? No, it's real. Come on, man. It's real. I did. I, I saw this today on, on X, but it can't be real. It can't be. I don't know if it's accurate that she made $200,000. Uh, yeah, it but. can't be. I mean, my, my, what are we now? Are we Rosencrantz, Einstein, bridge pilled, no. obsidian pilled? Coal soot. <laughs> Coal soot. <laughs> Cobalt pilled. I still don't believe someone made two hundred grand selling their own farts. I don't. I don't. I just don't believe it. It can't be true. <sighs> Aaron's montage. Book of Romans, anyone? Chapter one. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to have to take that back. Uh, Aaron's montage brought to you by our friends over at Birch Gold. You know, if you watch that and you're thinking, um, uh-oh. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, you got the... Uh, you got the message. Uh, the national debt skyrocketing $34 trillion. It's basically just a house of cards at this point. Um, I mean, if you look at that clip, Jerome Powell, the head of the Fed, did everything other than turn his pockets out 
like Aaron at Mount Sinai when he turned to Moses and said, I got nothing for you. I mean, I just, they handed me this gold. I threw it into the fires. This calf came out. I mean, what did you expect to happen? I mean, I just, and no answers. Okay. You're only the chief priest, dude. Okay. This is my, this maybe is why gold at its all time high right now. It's always been used as a hedge against government debasement schemes or managed declines. You know, like what's going on right now. Text Steve to 989-898. Get your free info kit on gold right now. Learn how you can convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold, and it won't cost you a penny out of pocket. Uh, With an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau, tens of thousands of happy customers, you can count on Birch Gold now, too. If you just text Steve to 989-898, claim your free info kit on gold to protect yourself from the uncertainty today. Text Steve to 989-899. Eight. All right, quickly on the economy thing, because there's another matter in Aaron's montage that I think needs to be addressed in detail. But if you, when you, when you break down a lot of deep economic analysis or theory or philosophy debate, you, you have to understand that people aren't voting on that. They, many of them don't yet understand it, don't know it. Um, most people don't know an Austrian school of economics from a Danish. Okay. So you have to, you have to look at it in the framework by which the people who are voting viscerally experience or feel these things. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. Okay. Because then it's not, it's not theoretical now. It's the old Ronald Reagan line when he was running against Jimmy Carter in 1980, um, you know, a, re- a, re- a recession is when your neighbor doesn't have a job, mm-hmm. and a depression is when you don't have right. one. Right? Okay. So, there. What are things that people experience? Well, that's number one. Do I have a job that pays the bills? Okay. So that that's number one. Am I confident in the income I am producing from my labor? Number one. Okay. Um, number two. Can I afford things? After I'm compensated for that labor, can I afford at least all the basics and several of the things that I want without having to go into too much debt? You know, can I afford things? Okay. Uh, For example, you know, I can't pay for a house probably even in the best of environments and cash, but do I have enough discretionary income that I would not have to finance a TV at a major outlet, but I could go, if I, if I needed a new one, I could go spend three, 400 bucks out of pocket at Walmart and still get a pretty nice name brand TV, which you can do in this economy, mm-hmm. right? Okay. Can I, can I, that, that's kind of what I mean by that. All right. So can I afford the, the kind of the, the accoutrements or expectations of the American dream and having a nice TV is part of the, that, you know, experience for most Americans. Can I afford those things? That's number two. Fair. Yeah. Okay. Number three is always the price of gas every single time okay in fact since the invention of the internal combustion engine and the assembly line there has there has well let me actually make it move it forward since the great depression in the post great depression era because when the great depression hit there were still a lot of americans that still didn't own a vehicle yet okay so in the post great depression era we've only ever had one recession ever that was not preceded by some form of spike in energy prices doesn't mean it was always the cause. Like, that's not necessarily what caused the recession of 08 and 09, right? Mm -hmm. But there's always a spike in energy prices every single time. There's been one exception, the COVID recession that we had. Remember the economy? Well, they technically didn't want to call it a recession because the rule typically is has to be like two or three consecutive quarters. Mm -hmm. But we did have economic contraction in the quarter, uh, the first quarter or so under COVID. Remember, that was actually driven by the healthcare sector because everybody thought that all these beds and everything going to be overrun all over the country and they weren't. And so they stopped taking all of their, you know, discretionary business in order to do the emergency stuff that ended up in many places outside of New York, Seattle and Detroit, a few others. You forgot to do air quotes, by the way, in emergency. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, They, 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 they were just empty in many places in America, which caused a recession, not to mention, you know, and, and, and fuel prices actually dropped during that period of time because we weren't allowed to go anywhere. Okay. So typically energy price spikes precede in some form of economic downturn, typically. So that's a three, okay? I mean, it used to be, you could kind of just tell, if you go back to 1976, for example, um, the only time a president did not win since Ford, 
There was a drop in, there was a slight drop in energy prices right before the 76 election under Ford, but we were already so deep into the energy crisis that it was going to take more for people not to feel it. All right. The, the only time a president not in power won, or I should say lost, after there had been a, 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 a clear decline in gas prices in the last report before the election was 2020. Another one of those odd trend lines we just seem to we just seem to defy. I mean, remember, like you know, Biden didn't win like any of the bellwether counties. He won like one of them. Remember that too. Like all these trends that have stood the test of time for decades just suddenly went out the window the minute we did mail-in ballots with no accountability or oversight. But I'm sure that's all just a coincidence, Magic. right? It is. <laughs> Magic. Yes. All right. Yes. Uh, jazz hands. That's what it was, basically. Um, so, okay, so gas prices is the third. Now, here's the fourth. Can I buy a home? I mean, that's that's really the linchpin for many people that I have, I'm connected to the American dream. Can I own my own home? And, you know, right now, you're looking at, with mortgage rates where they are, you're paying well over 100% more for a new mortgage right now than you were the day Joe Biden took over, 100% more. New mortgage, new mortgage applications right now are at early 1990s levels. Not like, you know, like in terms of raw numbers. And there's a lot more people looking for houses and there's a lot more Americans now than there were in the early 1990s, if that tells you anything, okay? So we all agree that those are, we could maybe put other things in here, but those are the four basics. Do I have a job? Can I afford stuff? Um, can I, you know, what's the cost of gas and can I buy it? Can I own my home, own a home if I want? Great baseline. Yeah. We, we get on those four corners yes. of kind of the average American yeah. middle-class existence or sure. what have you. Okay. All right. So if you're running for reelection, okay. And you know, you got the, uh, you've got those mail-in ballots in your back pocket. So knowing that, okay. But there, there's a margin that not even you can print enough paper without raising suspicion in certain places to overcome some of these things, right? Okay, so you, you got to have some case for your re-election, right? So you're Biden 2024, Jerome Powell comes out and says, we're, we're not looking at an interest rate. You just said now, last week, you said they're going to do three of them. Now he's saying they're not going to do any of them? Or we still don't know. It's just not going to do any right now. I, I don't know, man. Because he seen, literally said last week there's going to be three of them. Yes, I've seen multiple reports saying, oh, he's capitulated. Well, now, last week he said, no, we're not doing any rates cuts right now. He's saying the economy looks everything but rosy or everything and okay. rosy, uh, but we're still not going to do any rate cuts. I have no idea because I've, like you, I've seen both sides of this. I've seen exact opposite. From the reports. same guy, by the way, from the same source. Okay. So, number one, the labor market could be better. But you can always tell, not even our side is using that as a dominant talking point right now, right? Okay. The labor market sucks. People can't find a job. It could be better. But if I'm, if I'm Joe Biden running for re-election, I'm not that concerned about that right now. We're not, we're not even using that as a talking point on our own side, right? We're not even using that. So they could probably check that box for now. It, well. 30 agree. weeks out, it 30 weeks mean, out. It they, doesn't mean it's not an issue just because our side isn't arguing about it. Per yesterday's show, our side sucks, by the way. No, so. but our, but this is the stuff our side yeah. will, th this requires no moral stance. I don't have to expose myself, which is what we're going to get to with Bruce Jenner in a minute. Yeah. I, I don't have to be consistent on any moral level. I can just point to, this is the stuff ours, this is the low-lying fruit. If, if we had 8 9% unemployment, our side, that's all we'd be writing about right now, right? Okay, okay. so... Looking at it from their perspective, they could probably check the box. They're not really worried about the labor market as far as re-election is concerned. Fair? Okay. Number two, can I afford stuff? I think, I think that's an open question. I think what Jerome Powell said there is a far rosier scenario on where inflation is at than maybe most Americans feel at the moment. So they should be, if you're thinking about Operation Sunshine Pumping to win the election, number one, they're probably not concerned about. Number two, they are. Number three, the price of gas. Not really concerned about it right now. It's April 4th. If this was October 4th, they'd be concerned about that. Fair? But they don't have to be concerned about it right now. Well, let's get to the end because I have thoughts. Okay. And then the other one is the housing market. All right, which, which kind of ties in, can I afford stuff? Because some of the same forces that determine that cross over to determine the housing market as well. Okay. So... That tells me there, number four is a clear, that's not going to work. So that's, there's clearly going to be 
one or two interest rate cuts before the election. At least, I think. At least. Just a matter of how close to the election they are. Quick thoughts on, on just those things. If you, were a, if you were the Democrat candidate running for re-election for president and you're worried about those four things, kind of how I assess them today 30 and a half weeks out. You're right as a grown-up, but uh, we've talked about this a little bit before. Uh, it used to be, uh, and, and liberal reporters would say the same thing, it's the economy, stupid, right? You are doing an analysis that's a version of that. Mm -hmm. I'm just not so sure that's true anymore. I retweeted, and I'm sorry, I just cannot remember who wrote it, but a story yesterday about how COVID was not only a biological experiment on us, but it was a psychological exper what we, experiment on us, what we would accept, what we would endure. And that restaurant story about people getting fired, you know, those are the things that used to be economy stupid, especially in an election year where they're like, well, you know, no way, we can't touch that rail. COVID taught a lot of Democrats, though, that this stuff just doesn't matter as much. People simply will accept nonsense and not either not rightly apply who's at fault for it because they're so conditioned or well in Orwellian manners, four legs good, two legs bad. I'm just not so. We even you, saw this, Todd, in the 2012 reelection with Obama. The exit polling showed a majority of voters still blame the sluggish economy yeah, on George W. Yeah. Bush, who hadn't been president for four years. Again, a lot of this is embedded in your red wave and everybody's red wave analysis. I bought I mean, I accepted it as well. It, it, it didn't happen. I just don't know that these metrics apply to people's hearts you're, and minds you're like basically they, saying our level of comfort now has surpassed these metrics that ratio is inverted so the way we measure these metrics is going to have to be a lot more dire in order yeah, to disrupt I, that comfort that's what you're saying yeah okay i think that's i, mean, I can, I can see, promise you that's what the democratic party's counting on can't you see a lot of people and, in and, not, and their ballot harvesting yeah. operations can't you see a lot of people in california <laughs> flat out losing their job like that and going and voting democrat Oh, yeah. See, this is my point. Oh, yeah. And I know that's California, but yeah. in the other states, too, where you, the, those same people, I, they just don't process information. But we could, but there's, there's red states like Missouri where people in St. Louis and Kansas City are complaining about the, the filth and the crime, and they'll turn around and do the exact same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so, that's a great point. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I want to talk about the Jenner thing, the Bruce Jenner thing. Um, here's the reality of the situation. He is quite literally as much to blame for the current advent into the mouth of madness known as tranny madness as literally any soul on planet Earth is. Correct. I didn't say, did I say he was solely to blame? No. No. But he is as much to blame as any singular person alive is. He mainstreamed this. He was one of the most decorated athletes of the era world renowned and he allowed himself to become the agit prop for this he's he is he's the forerunner he's the lone voice crying out from reality tv make a crooked path he did this not all on his own but he was a very willing accomplice and to this day dressed in that ridiculous fashion looking like an like a, a a symbol of hi i need psychoanalysis or an exorcism yes he continues to be i've had some people say we could really use him right on no you can't he 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 undermines his own argument he's a symbol of it he is still the most famous symbol of it who is a more famous tranny in the world than bruce jenner do you know one no neither do i RuPaul might be more famous. He's not a tranny. He's a gay guy who dresses in drag. And that's what he was in 1988. And that's what he was in 1998. And that's what he was in 2018. And that's what he is now. Bruce Jenner wants you to believe his name is Caitlyn and he's a woman. He's the vanguard of this. He baptized people in this with mere water. And then the spirit of age came along and did the real thing. If he wants to help, repent! Repent! 
Wash the eyeliner off your face. Man up. Renounce what you have done. Repent. And become a symbol in the opposite direction as you continue to be in the direction we are now. If I beat my wife and I saw egregious examples of people beating their wives to death and I jumped on X and everybody knew I was a wife beater. I just hadn't gone this far. And I jumped on the largest social media platform for news narratives on planet Earth and said, that's just ridiculous. Beating your wife that much to the point she assumes room temperature is barbaric. And someone must do something about this. Would you want me as your spokesperson or proxy? Stop it. He's a spokesperson and proxy, all right, for the madness. He caused it more than anyone else, not all by himself, but more than any other person themselves ever has. We're largely here because of him. He is of no use to us except if he repents. Propping him up. And I don't care who does it, by the way. Thanking him, propping him up, undermining your own case. You will fail. We've done all this before. The conservative case for every deviancy, every heterodoxy. So we can show, we just, we're not haters. I hate. When I see studies like that, that's in the, that's in the Guardian, I hate what we did to those kids. Hate it. There are seven things the Lord hates, six that are detestable to him. Among them, hands that shed innocent blood. I hate what we did to those kids and are doing now, and you should too hate it. It's demonic. It's evil. It's not even a political ideology. It's a fart from hell. Hate it. Hate it so maybe we'll finally stop it if we hate it enough. And for Media Matters, for your weekend newsletter, that's D-E-A-C-E. This is not his path into the mainstream. This is not his. This isn't about him. We don't care about his guilt, shame. That's a him problem. He doesn't get to cost transfer. He doesn't get to project. This is like Anthony Fauci saying, someone do something about the jab. Your hands are on the weapon, brah. Own it. Repent. Same thing. It's disgusting. And I am just reviled and disgusted every time I see him proffered out there, either by others or himself. It's disgusting. It's revolting. Makes you want to make you want to vomit in your mouth. It's gross. Stop it. This is the part where Paul says, hey, that guy in the front row of the church, maybe we should have done in Corinthians instead. That guy with the front row in the church with his arm around his mom, throw him out. Throw him out. Get that guy out of here. Nope. Gone. And maybe outside the protection and shelter we're providing, maybe the spirit of the age will have such an impact on him, he'll feel guilty and come back. You know, repent. This is in an era where self-awareness is dead. We've said that many times. What Bruce Jenner has done is post-extinctive. This is the drug dealer doing lines on a mirror, regretting that some kid just OD'd from crack down the street. You sold it to him, dude. Stop it and repent.
Did you know your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality if you wake up too hot or too cold? I highly recommend you check out our friends over at Miracle Made Bed Sheets. They've got uh, technology inspired by NASA. It's a silver infused fabric that makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. They came on board last year. I mentioned we uh, tried them out last summer, and we had uh, one of the hottest summers on record in recent years here in Iowa. It's the first time since we started using these sheets. It's the first time I never had to use the ceiling fan during the summertime to help uh, supplement the central air in order to keep me cool enough at night to sleep. I was blown away. And so I thought, okay, well, it works one way. We had one of the coldest Januaries on record in Iowa here this year. And they were phenomenal uh, during the wintertime, too. So, I mean, hey, yes, they work in terms of temperature regulating. If you wrap yourself in aluminum foil and sleep in that, that'll regulate your temperature for you, too. All right? It's not very comfortable. So it's not just that it regulates your temperature. They're, they're pretty comfy, too. Uh, and we absolutely love them. Highly would recommend them. And everyone that's tried them so far has come back. And uh, if, you've, if I've gotten feedback from you guys in the audience, all of it's been positive. So give it a shot yourself at trymiracle.com slash dace. Uh, and if you're buying them for yourself or a gift for your loved one, you can save 40% when you go there. Trymiracle.com slash dace. And if you use our promo code dace at checkout, they'll throw in three free towels and you'll save an extra 20% as well. You can't beat it. Head over to trymiracle.com slash dace. I promise you won't regret it. Time now. Now for three non-political questions. We all have questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Who am I? A search and a question of identity. Why am I here? A question of meaning and purpose. Where am I going? A question of destiny. Some better than others. What sort of morality or proto-morality would you expect to find in a chimpanzee troop? Injecting some levity into the demise of Western civilization. It's three questions on the Steve Day Show. We do need a break from the demise and fall of Western civilization. Romans chapter one, notwithstanding, coming up next segment. Three (laughs) non-political questions. Three questions that I was definitely prepared for before the start of today's show. I just want everyone to know that. Uh, Question number one. In the vast landscape of science fiction pop culture, which futuristic technology or concept do you find most intriguing? And you can attack this from a number of angles, ethically, morally, uh, just uh, economically. Which futuristic technology do you find most intriguing? Wow, that's a great question. And... uh... I mean, I love the idea of traveling at uh, warp speed. Um, when I was younger, I would have said the holodeck, but seeing now where we're at with just proto versions of that on VR and metaverse, I'm thinking no. we should never, ever figure out that technology and, and execute the people who maybe do before they sell it to us. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, I'm going to go. So I'm going to be totally selfish. Can I be totally selfish? I think I know you're going to say. Yeah, because I've said it before. Yeah. I'm going transporter technology. See, this yes. is mine, but not for the same reasons. Okay, because uh, there's there's a lot of places in the world I would like to see that I don't want to travel to. You know, like I... Like, I don't, I don't want to have a four-hour layover in Egypt where the public toilets are like a hole in the ground. I don't want to do that. I'm an American. I'm an ugly American. If I cannot live in a place where a pizza can be delivered and or there is a reasonable threat, the pizza delivery man might get robbed. I don't want to live there. Okay. I think Taco Bell is superior to Mexican food. I am an ugly American. And so I'd love to see Rome and a lot of, I'd love to see Athens in these places. I don't want to travel. I don't want to be 18 hours on a plane. I don't even want to fly to Hawaii. Okay. So uh, I would, I love the idea. I'll take the gamble. You can scatter my atoms and if they splatter and, and, and it doesn't work out once and they can't be reformed, I'll never know. I mean, I'll just die in stasis and it'll be a quiet death. So I'm the risk to reward ratio is pretty good. Pretty positive. I'll take that. I'll go with transporter technology so I can finally see some stuff around the world. I'd love to see, and I don't really have to travel there. See, I want to go next, Todd, uh, because mine m- mine is the same thing, but for a much different reason. Okay, this is actually, you're a better person than me. Uh, probably, uh, no. <laughs> What's that certificate there behind you? Hundred uh, percent biblical understanding. Yes, 100%. biblical understanding. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. It's yes. not me saying that. It's the MI Institute. Here's the thing with transporter technology. Okay, if this was invented today, rolled out in mass tomorrow. Global economic devastation and desolation would follow on the third day. 
the number of industries that are tied to transportation as we currently know it, and it's for in its in its current forms of technological advancement yeah. across the board, those would be obsolete overnight. So you have to be really, really careful with this. It's a case study on early adoption and why usually early adopters of new technology have to play pay a premium for that technology. It's a real it's a, an interesting case study on that, but be very careful. With your with your yeah. love affair with transporter technology, Steve. Why do you want to bring the apocalypse on everyone, yes. Steve? And your coach to t- coach need for. I apologize to the lot boys at the various car lots in America that you're all going to be out of jobs. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I'm not saying we can never have it. It just needs to be slowly, very slowly rolled out. Okay. That was great. That that was an example of your 100 percent biblical worldview. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, the broader level of discernment executed there was a. Uh, Quasi impressive. Thanks, Todd. I, I want real lightsabers, uh, just so all of you toilets. Can we have? Can we fight on your lawn? Uh, well, so you, all you guys, all you guys who think y- you should be having those practice yard fights, actually have one in your hands, and you start cutting off your own limbs because you're fools. Yeah, let's see how this goes, guys. I just want to put it in your hands for real and see how that happens. What would your color lightsaber? I'm just kidding, Aaron. Go ahead. Question. <laughs> Is there a rainbow lightsaber? Do you think Todd would yes. dig that? Yes. Question number two. The Babylon Bee recently had a headline titled, To regain popularity, Major League Baseball to allow one player per team to take steroids. Now, hear me out. If that was an actual rule, one, would you be more inclined to watch Major League Baseball on a, on a day-to-day basis? And two, if you were the czar, not the commissioner, the czar of Major League Baseball, what one wholesale change to the, either the sport or the administration surrounding the sport would you make to make it more interesting, watchable, popular at large? All right. So as a, as a, as a one-time almost professional major league umpire, this is your wheelhouse. I'm going to let you go first. I definitely would not allow steroids. That, uh, that's the easy run. Uh, you know, rule-wise... Why? Explain why, just so people know. Because uh, oh, it's like bad for you and it's cheating and um, it, there's clearly side effects yeah. in terms of enhancements. What's the difference between because then we get into forms of supplements and things of like that like would you view human growth hormone, which is what we secrete on our own? We make this on our own. It's just as we you know, the, after we reach a certain age, usually around 30 or so, we start making a lot less of it in our body. If someone wanted to put something like a, a supplement of a natural substance that their body just doesn't produce the way it used to, would you view HGH as cheating? Uh, pr- probably. Okay. I think the, I don't think the science is quite as simple I agree, it's as not. that. I agree. Um, but steroids are they're, 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 they're an anabolic substance yeah. that's clearly an attempt to use a foreign agent, okay, to, to gain an advantage. That's obvious. But but in the and you know this as a as a va- anti vax guy, you're in that whole granola crunching world. The, there's a levels of subsidies or subsidies, yeah. supplements and stuff that you know that are homeopathic or natural that can give you big boosts in some of these areas. So if is that cheating or if it's a natural substance then it's not you know i don't know i'm yeah. asking okay but the the the, the games are, uh, amazing, have sped up they have that 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 actually amy and worked. i noticed it last summer we went to see a tiger doubleheader in cleveland we were shocked at how fast the games went by yeah it was but, very enjoyable but otherwise like with like with hockey fights I, do, hockey fans would be mad, wouldn't they? Steve, this is more your sport. Mm-hmm. If you got rid of hockey fights. Yeah. Right? Like last night, this in fact, the, the Rangers and Devils had a, a had a line brawl to right start out. the oh, game. Yeah. The I've never yeah. seen that before, See, to start the game. Yeah. I, 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 this is not me just like the lightsaber thing. I would get rid of instant replay. You Now, Ranager comes out. On a, an absolute whacker. The difference, I mean, it's this. Mm-hmm. And at full speed, oh, what are we doing here? So you might get that right. You might get that wrong. It, let's move on with our lives. That's baseball. No, we're going to Zapruder film this thing. We're going to look at it over and over again. And then the manager just comes out, walks out, and says, I'd, uh, I'd like you to go to instant replay. In the past, Earl Weaver came out and got in your f- grill. Lost and baseball his mind. was more exciting. What are we doing? Yeah. This is dumb. Yeah. Get rid of instant replay. So... I would not allow the steroids, but man, I got to admit, I love the steroid era. Chicks do love the long ball, and so do I. Okay, so, um, but I think they've actually made a lot of good changes to speed the game up. Agreed. And I just can't watch any of them. 
Um, oh, that's another. Yeah, that came. There's a news story about Iowa. Like, the, are you talking about blackouts? Yeah, it's yeah. been that way for years. Like oh. everything is since you know we don't have our own team. Like uh, we have six teams in Iowa. So if the game's not on ESPN, like, you, you can't or, or major no network can't, can't watch, watch anything. It. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I would change that. Okay. Uh, you've, you've got to make your game accessible yeah. to everybody. I mean, it may, there's no reason why you can literally watch virtually any college football or basketball game televised in America, living in Iowa, Wyoming, uh, you know, pick other states that don't have major league sports franchises. There's many. Montana. All right. You can watch any college football or basketball game you want. I should be able to watch any major league baseball game that I want. And, and since a lot of the franchises have their own parochial television deals, I would, I would think that would even add to the value of them because more people watching, it means that there's higher valuation in the commercials that you're selling in there, right? And you're making more money mm-hmm. off of that. Uh, so I'd, I'd make, I, I think they've done a great job dealing with the slowness of the game as much as you can. Now, I don't think the game is slow, but I'm from a different generation, okay? As much as you can for millennials and particularly Gen Zers, I think they've dealt with it without harming the essence or fabric of the game. I wouldn't do any more. So at this point, I just make your game more accessible yeah. to people. Um, so you kind of answered my question for me with what you just told me about the television situation. I, I mean, you should be able to watch every Major League Baseball game on TV anywhere in America where you live. That, that should be an automatic. So the, the question about the Babylon Bee headline, no, I would not be more inclined to watch it. I'd actually be less inclined to watch it because to me... Ostensibly, what you're saying here is that there's going to be one guy who's capable of hitting a dinger out into the, the riverfront every single at-bat. He's just going to get walked every time, that, if that's what we're saying here. Mm-hmm. So that's going to make it less interesting. So no, I would not be more inclined if there is one guy roided out up on every single team. I, here's what I would do specifically. I would get rid of the, I know this is going to be a hard pill to swallow for some of the major markets, like the top five to ten markets that have Major League Baseball teams. I would get rid, I would get rid of the regional sports networks. I would just get rid of those nationalize the product let tbs tnt i think tbs tbs has a tuesday night package every week let espn let uh, big fox or maybe fs1 bid on packages uh, democratize the process of actually putting these games on the air and i believe already mlb network has kind of whip around coverage now mlb network is not on youtube tv anymore so i can't really watch it but i would also standardize and their the- whip around coverage is good yeah. You see, I, it's not the same as Red Zone. It's a different sport. I understand yeah. that. But yeah. here's what I would do to kind of help that and kind of uh, pick up, help pick up the pace a little bit. I would standardize broadcast windows. That's the problem, I think, right now. With like the what whip, the NFL does. With the whip around coverage. Yeah. So there's an average of 13 games every day. Let's say there's one or two in the afternoon. That's still going to be a, you know, 11, 12 games in the evening hours. Start one set of games, you know, six games at 6.30, 7.30 uh, Eastern time. Start another set of games at 9.30 Eastern time, 10.30, what, what have you. I think that will help you. That would give you four hours, five hours, maybe even six hours every single night of whip around coverage on MLB Network. And I think that would be greatly beneficial to increase access to the game. So not only getting rid of the regional sports networks, which are the main reason why so many people uh, right now have blackouts, Iowa is the worst. So again, I'm kind of biased that way, but get rid of those, nationalize, democratize the process, and then standardize uh, the uh, broadcast windows for games. What I was going to say until you alerted me to the TV situation, because I've always just watched stuff on the MLB network or direct TV, so I was not aware of this. Until you alerted me to the TV situation, what I was going to say is call the actual strike zone. That is one thing that would organically speed up the game another way without messing with the fabric or essence of the game. Call the actual strike zone. That was what I was going to say. Yeah, they're good. I mean, I mean, no, no one's no one has struck out on a pitch above the belt since like you know 1977. Yeah. Okay. I don't, but they're going to robot umpires, and I mean, I'd rather not. Okay. Number three. The marketing slash culinary departments at one of the major fast food chains calls you up and says, hey, we need a million dollar idea. What food dish are we missing in our menu? Again, it has to be a fast food chain. What food dish are we missing that we must include that would be successful at a national level? What food dish is that that you would tell them and which chain would carry it? Wow. I, you go, go ahead. Well, I, Cause this, this give me, I've got to think about this. Wow. Not okay. being in a big city, like, and we've had a couple of, um, here over the 20 plus years I've lived that have failed, but we need like good Chicago dogs. 
like good hot dogs. That's a good answer. It chi- a chili, to all that stuff. It, it, there's no fast food. The one fast food uh, place that um, does that, it, we finally is Freddy's. Mm-hmm. Which there is one now, like, a, but that's big in Kansas City, so you can go there and get a you know a passable Chicago dog. And I love Chicago dogs, so that's what I would say. You guys know in the South, blew my mind when I saw this for the first time. You could just go through a drive-through and get alcohol. Really? Yeah, just go through a drive-through and get a and get a drink. That blew my mind that you could do that. You know, maybe it's my Yankee uh, puritanicalism, but that that like was mind blowing. The first time I was in Louisiana, and we weren't like in the French Quarter, we weren't in New Orleans. Like just driving around rural mm-hmm. Louisiana, heading to Lafayette to go do an arena football game, and you just go through the drive-through maybe and you're not get a hurricane, ugly. get a martini. Maybe you're not as ugly American as you think. <laughs> but uh, you know what? Yeah, there's so many options already coming up with an answer is hard. But here's one thing that is not really readily available, at least where we live. Maybe it is everywhere in other places. When I was in high school growing up in Michigan, there were places where you could do uh, drive-through slices of pizza. And it was, I mean, the, I mean, it was, you know, maybe a notch above the the peach you, you ate in the, the government school where you peeled the yeah. cheese off of and then you know you you folded sure. the bread and then the, you wrung the grease out and then ate it okay but um but in a pinch oh yeah yeah see. when you just you, you got to get some za see and you and you're you're on the road i don't okay. need a whole pie i just need a slice man i just need a slice that would you know there you there are some places in iowa where here locally that you can walk in and get a slice but you know i'm the ugly american can i just drive through your problem is like mine in new york you basically if you're on the streets you can walk in yeah Yeah. chicago you and i basically have the same problem because if i lived in like chicago or new york on the streets i'd be eating at that hot dog vendors all the time yeah i think if you've never been to new york city i know the old joke about ray's pizza and elf there are it's not necessarily right but there's like a million of these kinds mm-hmm. of places yep. with all the same names and which one's real and which one's not yep. that you're just and a lot of people walk or go back and forth between public you know trans transport yep. places so you can just you know stop in and grab a slice but if we're in not in a place like that can you i can I at least get a decent piece of pizza you know i can get one at a gas station but what if i'm just you know driving through can i get one i think i I thought about that the problem with slices of pizza is that if it's actually served hot and on demand you know the, the 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 side effect of that is that some of the toppings could slide off so i've thought of this when i was in high school working at made right which is a an iowa chain here it's not a national loose chain. meat sandwiches yeah loose meat chan- s- sandwiches we also served godfather's pizza and then alongside those calzones they're just a self-encapsulated That's a good too yeah basically pizza product but yeah. they're not quite as messy so like I'd a say, pizza roll giant pizza like, roll is basically like, the calzone yeah, yeah pizza roll yeah uh it took like five minutes to to make one that's that's pretty fast so calzones that's a good idea too all right we'll come back it'll be theology thursday in a moment stay tuned Back here with Hour 2 here on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Todd Erz and Aaron McIntyre and all of you. And you can let us know what you think about what we think via the SteveDace.com inbox. Just email us, Steve at SteveDace.com, D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, MeWe, and Gab. Follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Getter, Instagram, and TikTok. If you're a podcast listener, thank you very much. Please uh, show your appreciation for the show, if you like it, by leaving us a five-star review wherever you podcast from. And then hit subscribe, or if you're on iTunes, which many of you are, hit follow, and that way every time... Uh, now that you're connected to our uh, our page and our podcast feed, every time we do a new show, a new podcast, it'll show up in your feed every single time. And thank you to all of you that have done those things for us as well. Thanks as well to our friends over at Hillsdale College. They're trying to do something uh, about the cultural hijacking that is well underway and trying to reverse that trend. So many free online courses they offer, one right now that is certainly worthwhile you want to check out from noted historian Victor Davis Hanson. I know a lot of you know who he is and are fans of his work. It's called American Citizenship and Its Decline. It goes into the history of citizenship. I think I've mentioned this before. One of the things that uh, growing up or as I was coming of age politically and listening to the uh, our elder generation of uh, conservative media stalwarts, one of the things that stuck with me for many years, I heard Mark, when I first heard Mark Levin say it, we're not a nation of immigrants, we're a nation of citizens. That just 
just radically shifted my, you know, it was a paradigm shift to even contemplate what that meant. That's kind of what this course is about. The history of citizenship explains how it is undermined in America today by open borders, identity politics, etc. cetera. Uh, if you take this course, you'll gain a deeper insight about the connection between citizenship and freedom uh, and therefore why you have to undermine our citizenship to take our freedoms away. So sign up today for Hillsdale's free online course, American Citizenship and Its Decline, by going to DACE4, F-O-R, DACEforHillsdale.com. Again, that's DACEforHillsdale.com. And we now begin. We We will be going through the ESV version of the scriptures. That's my favorite version. The one that uh, Paul was reading as he wrote this, of course. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. Yeah, I'm I'm just kidding. We're off. Yeah. Here we go. Going to be something. Didn't even get to verse one. All right. (laughs) All right. So um, I'm going through again uh, Spurgeon's verse by verse exposition of Romans. Aaron, you're using uh, what now? R.C. Sproul's The Righteous Shall Live by Faith, his verse-by-verse exposition. All right, and then, Todd, you're using Scott Hahn's commentary on Romans. I am. It's actually on my bedside table because I was engrossed in it last night and I forgot to pack it in my bag. But But you've got to download it. It's in there somewhere. It's there. And, and, And Scott, I love... You know, like I subversively, I'm like, well, I'll just go with like the greatest English speaking preacher that maybe ever lived. And I'll just, you know, say these aren't my takes, they're his. Aaron's like, I'm going to go full blow, full blown reformational style. Like I'm in the middle of like a nine part series of sermons this that Sproul did on just Sola Scriptura. Nine parts. How many pages? Okay? How many pages is your... Uh is your commentary. Mine is 230 some, 232 pages. Mine is almost 500 pages. That, all right. Mine so, is closer to yours. Too. So we thought we were pretty clever here, and we were going to have him cornered. Todd decides he's going to go with uh, Scott Hahn, who is a what now? Former Protestant preacher who F- became former, Catholic. E- former evangelical preacher who's now a Catholic apologist, yeah. So I think the odds here are pretty even, actually. I think this is a pretty fair fight. Fair? Oh, yeah. I, I'm looking at this as mostly born out of uh, fellowship. I mean, I, oh, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not worried about this on our end, in this room at all. What happens on the other end? Yikes. Worried about your feeds and your inboxes. Wor- <laughs> pray- thoughts and prayers for those. How many <laughs> times will I be condemned to hell in the next 24 hours? How many times, Aaron, will you and I be told that we have allowed the Romanists to hijack the faith and have not correctly punished Todd for his heterodoxical views? Just now. We just got and told that again. Yes. In, in fairness, we have to get to this conversation like in the first three verses. Yes. Like it's, it's right there. It's yes. not like anybody trying to just shoehorn it in. So as I mentioned at the top of the show, our intent as we go through this study is to make it very informal. To go through this verse by verse, we don't have prescripts uh, or anything prescripted, no talking points necessarily that we're likely to check the box of, no expectation of how much text we will get through, um, and we'll we'll discuss it. We've got 30 minutes, about 30 minutes every week, more like 20, 25, and we'll just see where the rabbit trails take us. Once a month, we will break and um, and get to you guys' feedback on what we've talked about thus far. And, and we'll break from the scripture to engage what you guys think and let you guys hold our feet to the fire or give us your feedback. That should be fun. All yeah. right. So let us begin. And we're using the ESV version, as I mentioned a minute ago, the English Standard Version. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So here is what Mr. Spurgeon says about this passage. Paul has many titles and he delights to mention them in writing to these Christians at Rome. He puts his, he puts first his highest title, a servant of Jesus Christ. I think that's very interesting there. That his highest title is that he's basically a disciple. He's a follower. It's, it's not the ecclesiastical authority that he will claim later on, but his highest title here, according to Spurgeon is the honor he has of being a disciple of Christ. He glories in being a servant of the crucified Christ, a servant of him who is despised and rejected of men, and so should we. 
Paul was called out from among men, effectually called of God to be an apostle separated or set apart. For people, if you guys don't know, there's a version of the Bible called the Amplified that's kind of cool when you first start out, but then it gets a little laborious in my view because it, it kind of gives you the translations of like every word that could be translated into key terms and in the, that's why it's called Amplified, okay, and the various Greeks and, uh, and, and Latin, uh, you know, codexes we have, the original texts. And one of the one of the phrases for holy you will get, like God calls us in the Old Testament to be holy as I am holy, says to the Israelites, right? One of the one of the phrases that means holy, according to our English translation, is set apart. Because we're not pantheist, we're not panentheist. God is not in a circle of life. He's not He's not one with the creation. He's set apart from it because we broke it with our sin. It wasn't originally that way, right? Originally, Adam and Eve. They had direct communion with God. It was not originally that, okay? But we broke it. They broke it with sin. We break it with our sin. So now God is set apart from the creation. And Jesus is the one who comes along and restores that bond. Um, so to be holy means to be set apart. That's one of the translations. Um, he believed that he was separated for that purpose at his birth, but he was specially separated unto the gospel of God on the road to Damascus. It is a happy thing when a minister feels that he has nothing to do with anything else but the gospel that commands all his thoughts, all his talent, and all of his time. Aaron, anything you want to call out of uh, what, uh, what Dr. Sproul writes about this? He's not content with the translation of the word... Uh servant you'll see some translations say bond servant mm -hmm. and i thought it was interesting the reason he gives is that the greek word that, that paul uses there is i think it's doulos or doulos i'm sure there are people who have taken greek courses who are going to correct a lot of uh what i'll <laughs> bring to the table but that translation literally means not a servant who comes and goes as he pleases but a slave who has been yes. purchased in a part of mm -hmm. his master's possessions. Mm -hmm. And that's very important because that's a major theme. I mean, the, the name of his commentary is the righteous shall live by faith. That's part of, that's part of the theme of, of this book of Romans is that you will either be a slave to Christ, i.e. righteousness, right. or you will be a slave to sin. Mm -hmm. And he lays that out very clearly here in the coming passages. God's, so the greetings, his longing to go, go to Rome, God's righteousness, and then the wrath of, of God has been uh, revealed. So that's a very important, I think, distinction, I think, that Sproul brings to the, the, the table. The same. Hans spends quite a bit of time talking about in the translation. Uh, New American uh, standard is what uh, Catholics tend to use. And it is about slave, and he makes it all the more important. Why, you know, why Paul, uh, a, a wordsmith, and a philosopher in his own right would use this. Well, Steve, you, you've all, uh, you've pointed out regularly over the years uh, how Paul negotiated this world and how he turned the tables on a situation by claiming the rights as both Roman and Jew and making that clear. Mm -hmm. Well, so what a right is and who has them is something he is very much dialed in on. And the notion of slavery... And what it is, not chattel slavery, but mm -hmm. the slavery that was far more common in that is also very known to people. Yes. Like, like the Lord using parables, he made, he talked about things that were known experientially to people. So people really knew what a slave was and what that meant in terms of rights or no rights. So using a word like slave versus a ro just a, mo a more, a bland term like servant mm -hmm. was um, an important distinction but the term, and you use the term chattel slavery, the term slavery at the time this was being written <clears throat> did not necessarily always carry with it the, the historical connotations and, and, and applications as we have them today. Right. Meaning we're dealing in a pre, like there's another book of the Bible, Philemon, where a slave is, yes. is urged to return back to his master. OK, and that was that was used by Confederates in other eras as uh, well. You know, that's why we can't have an underground railroad. You have to, you're taking the you have to understand the context text with it. We're going to say this a lot in this study. At least I am. And it's something that stuck with me. The first Bible conference I ever went to. I've mentioned this before. And the only speaker I can remember is when he said this text without context is just pretext. Mm -hmm. You have to understand the context of the times that this is being written to and the audience it was intended for. 
so that we're not projecting our own biases and circumstances yeah. upon the text. In okay? this case, it's indentured <clears throat> servitude closer to that. Right. But in Aaron's point... Now, you, there was chattel slavery at this time there, in history. It did exist, But yeah. it was not the exclusive right. institution of slavery. We're dealing with, with proto-forms of economics. We're not even... We're, forget pre-Industrial Revolution. We're pre-feudalism. Yeah. We're pre-mercantilism. All right? And so we're at very nascent stages of any form of trade or commerce whatsoever at this time in history and so there were there were, the idea i'm gonna to go to high school and i and i'll get a job at the coal plant and make a nice living right. no 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 no. all right so you were like in the you were in the upper class or if you weren't there weren't any other classes okay so you either went to the military and tried to earn your station that way women turned to prostitution all right so a lot of times slavery as it was connoted here uh in, in many cases denotes what the economic labor class was at the time okay so it doesn't carry with it the low it's a little bit like the it's a little bit like again i mentioned this yesterday remember when matt walsh went to africa for um yeah what's a woman and they just looked at him like what what there is a multiverse mm-hmm. i mean what is this what are you talking about what sorcery is this right mm-hmm. you know and so similarly you know in in those african villages time hasn't moved at the rate that it's moved here Okay, and and here in the West, in the modern West. And so they aren't hung up on certain, you know, they don't know what a third wave feminist is. They would just like it to not be a drought. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so in this period of time, was there chattel slavery? Yeah. In fact, we see in the Old Testament, the Israelites are are subjected to it. The Assyrians come, they conquer the 10 northern Mm -hmm. kingdoms. They take they take bits and put them in the noses of Israelites so they could string them together on chains and lead them back to Babylon, where Assyria was from. That's a form of chattel slavery slavery right yes. okay but by and large it was also just an economic institution for the exchange of a labor so you could avoid you know being destitute uh, and then maybe being sold into chattel slavery for that for that matter but i like Eric, the way you put it he's trying to make clear either way i can't come and go as i please on mm-hmm. this i am an indentured servant Correct. to the lord that's yeah. the express point yeah. you should take away and, from and that's the that's the other part about set apart for the gospel of god that, that's the that's the part two of that is that Sproul's uh, analysis of that portion of of the verse is that categorically he has been planted in the category of working set apart for the gospel of God and uh, from amongst the the crowds he has been set apart. So that's kind of uh, dovetails with what you were just saying, Todd. Since we just did the evergreen with Greg Locke, let's go ahead and chase it. Let's chase our first official rabbit trail in the study, shall we? Okay. All right. First time you guys have ever met me, and I tell you, hey guys, I'm Apostle Steve. Your reaction is what? No, you're not. Why would you have that answer, Aaron? Because there are no Apostle Steves. Todd, how how would you react to, I tell you I'm Apostle Steve? I'd uh, ask you uh, what you think that term means and what church you belong to. I, this is the next place I wanted to go. It, mm-hmm. it, has, it has, we have to go there. And I don't need to really say, obviously as a Catholic within the creed, one holy Catholic and apostolic, mm-hmm. I, I'm fascinated to know what you guys say. And I, I just want to hear, what does this term mean then? And why, and, and where did it go? Because we still believe, if you are if you are the Pope, if you are a bishop, you are a direct line. We don't call them. We have different words for them. Mm-hmm. But you are a direct line set apart. It is, and Scott Hahn talks about this. These aren't just flowery terms. These are actually designations mm-hmm. of what you are to do. It is a leadership structure then as now. But how do you guys interpret that word? And then where did this go over time? Aaron, why would you say that there are no Apostle Steves? Why would you say that? In the context of it's the year, uh, when did we meet? 2015 or started work. It's mm-hmm. the year 2015. Uh, in, the, in, the, in my mind, growing up with my background, the Apostles, in terms of authority, that's, that's, the, that's the word, that's the connotation that yes. I associate with Apostle. And you're right. Authority. Uh, Steve, in the year 2015... <laughs> You may be a wonderful disciple, 
of Jesus Christ. You're not on the same level as apostle. That's that's the word that I've always associated with mm-hmm. authority, given specific authority given by by So Jesus you view Christ. it as an ecclesiastical term. Correct. Okay. So are there modern day Protestants? Uh, I might excuse me, amongst Protestants, are there modern day apostles? Well, that's what we're going to discuss okay. here. We're Good. discussing it now, actually, because okay. this is this is the term cessationism, which came up in the conversation I had with Greg Locke. Yeah. This is a big debate within evangelicalism, yeah. okay, uh, in particular. Um, and and so, early in my career, I've mentioned this gentleman's name before. It was he's passed away several years ago, um, but early in my career, he was one of the best friends I ever had, and was was a played a huge role in provoking me onto the road that I am now. I was content just to stick in sports talk radio, even as a Christian for the first few years and make a nice, have a nice life doing that. And he challenged me on multiple levels. My, my old friend, Jonathan Narciss. And I'll never forget. He said this to me and I was still a baby Christian. I didn't even know what the term meant. I had to look it up. He said, I believe you have an apostolic calling based on the giftedness that I see. And he, and he, then he, but he was very clear. He also wanted to make it a distinction. I'm not claiming you're an apostle. I didn't even understand why at this point in time, I'm very young in all this. I didn't know why this distinction needed to be made. You know, I'm like, how is somebody have a, first of all, you know what apostolic meant. I didn't even know what it meant. I had to go home and look it up. And you know me, I'm not going to tell you, I don't know what it means. I just nodded and then went home and looked it up. <laughs> okay. So I, I don't know what it means. Okay. And, and, and then I don't even, since I don't know what it means, I don't know why a distinct, he felt necessary for me to draw a distinction between an apostolic calling or giftedness and being an actual apostle. Okay. Particularly because he was black. And you see this terminology used a lot in the quote unquote black church in many places now, because a lot of them also um, have charismatic or Pentecostal influences. A lot of them in America do. And so um, that's the, so Aaron, do you believe that anyone that, or someone, not anyone, someone can be given a specific level of apostolic calling or giftedness, meaning that they can speak truth to large subsets of Christians, including churches and congregations, okay? But but they're not terraforming scripture when they speak like Paul did, okay? As a specifically designated apostle, but, but they're apostolically essentially uh, reasserting the authority of what the scripture says to a broader um a broader audience of Christians and maybe even Christian leaders. Do you, do you, would you abide that distinction or not? I could, if we're talking about specifically in the context of, of what we're beginning with here in the book of Romans, there, uh, there were three, uh, three benchmarks, three standards set in the early part of the book of Acts for this apostle. So this is, this kind of goes back to the cessationist debate as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do miracles happen? Or do miraculous things happen? Because the apostles could perform them with the authority that they were given. Yeah, do miracles yeah. do miracles happen or do miraculous things happen? And mm-hmm. what are the so- source of those? So are things apostolic in terms of an adjective? I guess that would be an adjective. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Are people apostles in terms of the way that we're talking about them here in the book of Romans and as defined in the book of Acts? So specific, no. specifically anointed ecclesiastical Correct. authorities. Correct. Meaning that... So... I'll just use my own situation for an example, using what Jonathan said, that maybe I have some, we all have our own giftedness. I have a certain giftedness to communicate the authority of the scriptures to large groups of people to, to in, provoke and, and encourage them to get back on the narrow road. Okay. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't, but I'm not speaking with the authority that what I'm saying is scripture. Check what I'm saying up against the scriptures themselves. Which, by the way, the Berean church did, the, and, and Paul, Paul as it was an apostle. The Bereans checked what Paul told them against the scriptures, and he credited him, he praised them for doing that, if I recall, right? So um, would you agree with that distinction? Yes, and, okay. and I think it's in line, you know, with the word Christian, which means what? Little little Christ, Mm -hmm. you know, that it's that same type of idea. So apostolic doesn't necessarily mean you are an apostle, That to me, it's just an adjective of reaffirming the, the, the original apostles authority given directly by Jesus Christ. This is where we now, so this debate is raging right now, but it's really not raging about apostolic authority. It's really raging about whether individuals are, have the power 
to do supernatural things or is God just performing miracles in the church age? That's fair. Okay, that's really what we're talking about. Uh, That's what most of the cessationist argument is. I struggle with cessationism. I said this when we interviewed Greg Locke. Um, I, I... I, I don't see a clear biblical case for it, but I, but on the other hand, I can understand why the doctrine is popular because I think many of their complaints against charismatics are valid, if that makes sense. I, yeah. I, I think charismatics, by and large, I mean, I, I love, I'll say this, I, I love Dr. Michael Brown. I've known Michael Brown for many years. He's been a great positive influence for me and a great resource for me. He's been a guest on the show many years. I watched an interview that he did recently uh, with uh, Justin Peters, who's maybe the smartest cessationist in America, certainly among them. And and I watched, it was a round table actually, Aaron. Did you see this too? This be- no, okay. I didn't. And, and, but I got to say, if, if, if we can't say clear heretics who are claiming my foot grew and I'm punching people in the spirit, oh, come on. If we can't say that guy's a heretic, you know, I, I, I think charismatics are their own worst enemy for their argument. They, they, they seem to resist, and I'm going to get emails already, but this is what we do this for. I, when I say th- they, I'm not talking about like you specifically. I go to a charismatic church, Okay. My pastor, Pastor Jesse, believes you can speak in tongues. He will stand up at the pulpit and say, do not speak in tongues without an ability to, to interpret it in my church. Don't do that. We don't know what you're saying. You're just babbling. Might not be the Holy Spirit. Might just be, you're nuts. Don't do that. So there, in other words, there's got to be a plumb line, some authority here. Yeah. So how we know what you're doing right. isn't just, you know, last night's pizza. Okay. Right. And, I, and I do think within charismaticism, my own observation as someone who does this professionally, studies this stuff a lot because it's my mission in life, frankly, and it's the number one goal of my show is to communicate a biblical worldview. So I'm no expert, but I'm I'm certainly more informed than the average layman. I think is that a is that a humble fair? Sure. You guys okay with that? Yes. Yeah. I'm not an expert, but well more informed than the average layman. My observation in general is is that the charismatic movement is very resistant to accountability internally. And that's how you end up, you know, on round tables, getting your teeth kicked in by Justin Peters. OK, because even if you don't agree with his do- with his hermeneutic on 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 spiritual giftedness, the, the stuff he's pointing out, in my view, about what some of these people are claiming is 100 percent right on the money. The complaints absolutely are. You know, like I remember, remember what there, you guys actually weren't working here yet. Several years ago, there was a conference that uh, John MacArthur was holding about charismatics. It was called Strange Fire. That's a biblical reference. OK. And uh, and I interviewed both John MacArthur and I'm trying to remember who the uh, the noted charismatic was that I had on the show. And 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 I'm still I'm, I'm still relatively new at a lot of this. OK. And, and the noted charismatic, when he laid out his larger exegetical framework for why he thinks the way he thought i thought it was i was very sympathetic to his reasoning okay when john MacArthur came on my show and and pointed out all the silliness that people are doing within that hermeneutic i was very sympathetic Mm -hmm. to what he's you guys remember go back and look at the interview i did with greg Locke last week i said to him the reason why i've never taken what your deliverance ministry seriously before is because your film come out in Jesus name was the first time I've ever seen this done that it, that it didn't require. I give seven offerings before you might be able to cast the demons out of me. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. The Benny Hinn act, you know, that kind of stuff, which I think is complete flat out heresy scam. Um, and uh, it, 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 there, if you could really heal people, I promise you the Holy Spirit gave you that gift. Not and it only doesn't work when the, when 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 um, uh, the uh, you've you've made the, uh, the 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 plate ring with the with the change in the dollar bills you've put in there. I promise you, he wants you to t- the Holy Spirit wants you to take that gift and go through the, the pediatric AIDS ward to start laying hands on people. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Okay, do that. It doesn't just work when there's a large arena that, that an NBA champion plays in or a Super Bowl is played in and, and you're walking out of there with, you know, a half a million dollars in offerings. It, it didn't require, you know, we had a reformation over stuff like that, if I recall, actually, Mr. Teckel. OK, so I, I, I'm fascinated by divorcing those 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 claims of giftedness from the money grubbing that we typically see them associated with today. Thoughts? Well, I've just, 
on the miraculous side of things, from the Catholic perspective, the most important part of this is uh, uh, the Eucharist transubstantiation, that, uh, how that uh, advocates for that. But also, in terms of leadership, once again, Paul is very clear in his earlier letters before Romans that uh, he's a leader, what that means he has the ability to appoint leaders and say which so-called leaders aren't leaders. There's a definitive s sense of who the leaders are and who you must listen to. Mm -hmm. Paul appoints Timothy. He gives him authority. So when we're talking about call to, set apart, how that order of operation works then, and what changed? Because Aaron in his candor right now just said, no, that it, the apostles don't exist in the same way. Catholics believe they do. So what... What changed and when is a, is, is a crucial question to me. We're going to disagree on what yeah, transubstantiation it's a fair means. Question. But yeah. in terms of who an actual leader is, mm -hmm. the, you, in your part, the plumb line, mm -hmm. the plumb line is way more up for grabs from a Protestant interpretation. Even I agree. if the Catholics are I wrong, don't disagree with the that. this is the Catholics say it started then. Yeah. And yeah, they've gotten it wrong. And you can point to having three popes at once and it's been chaos at times, but we still, this is the rule. So Aaron, how would you respond to that? Cause well, I think that is a great question. So what, what context are we talking about here? Cause this is the, the, the distinction that I'm trying to, to make here is that when we're talking about Paul's claim of apostleship, he's he's making a claim that he was, in, and it's true, uh, he was making a claim that he met the criteria as defined uh, by the early part of Acts. However, the meaning of the word apostolos, which is where we get our word apostle from, just means one who is sent. Yes. So, yes, I do believe in, in, the, in the sense that we're talking about, in the sense that Paul is talking about here, we don't have those apostles. If you're talking about, yes, we do have that same type of, of apostle these days, I would disagree with that. If we have apostles in terms of one who is sent, I would listen to that argument. So what changed? That's the crucial question. When did it end? When did real apostles stop in, the, in your mindset? We don't necessarily have an answer to this. That's why we claim it ended with the apostolic era. When the apostles died out, it ended with them. And why? See, I don't know why. I mean, I, I, I mean, well, let me rephrase this. I do know why. I don't biblically understand the reason why we can make that case, which is why I don't, I don't have that position. I, I struggle with, I, I, this is why I have the position of, I don't agree with the doctrine, but I agree with almost all of its criticisms, okay? Because we've, we, many people justify doing absolutely nutty, crazy things and just claim, well, the Holy Spirit directed me to that, you know? Well, there has to be an authority somewhere. And we're going to keep coming back to that over and over again. See, that's really what we're talking about. We're not debating cessationism. We're debating authority. Yeah. And, and, and basically every argument that Catholics and Protestants have really isn't theological. It's ecclesiastical. Catholics hold those positions because they believe the church is the authority and that's their positions. Mm -hmm. We hold these positions because we think the scripture is the authority and that's what the script, we think the scripture says. So we're really not debating doctrine we're really debating authority and that's why by the way what's the first thing paul asserts when we first start this letter what's the first thing he asserts his authority yeah yeah one verse one <laughs> week <laughs> all right we'll come back more in a moment All right, coming back here on the Steve Day Show, brought to you by our friends over at Patriot Mobile. Thankfully, they are one place, the mobile phone industry, and that's a product we all pretty much need nowadays. That's the one place where the alternative parallel economy is fully in place. You no longer have to give money directly to people that hate you. And you can go with an outstanding product with a company that has outstanding customer service as well at Patriot Mobile for a decade now. They've been America's really only American mobile phone provider. If you make the switch today and join up, their customer service team will customize it for you any way you want. Uh, you can upgrade your phone. Keep the one you like. If you already have one, you do. You can change your number. Get a new one if you want. Uh, they'll customize it however you want. And anytime you need to switch to one of their other networks within their parent network because you're moving somewhere, 
or any other reason, they'll let you do that for free. You can't beat it. Make the switch today. If you're a veteran or first responder, let them know when you go to make the switch. And if you do, they've got extra ways to say thank you for your service. All of us, though, can just use my name, Steve, as a promo code to get a free activation today. If you make the switch at PatriotMobile.com slash Steve, that's PatriotMobile.com slash Steve. Use the promo code Steve. Well, if there was ever a book written by somebody not on this show that was meant to be discussed on this show, on this day, especially on this day, or as we launched our uh, our first Theology Thursday Bible study on Romans today. This is the book. Yes. Okay. I mean, the title, the subtitle, it's something we could have written. He just thought of it first. All right. It's called Pagan America, The Decline of Christianity and the Dark Age to Come from John Daniel Davidson over at The Federalist. And we welcome him here to the blaze today. John, it's an absolute pleasure, man. And congratulations on writing this book before I even thought of it. So thank you for that, too. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Let's Glad use, to be here. Let's go with the word pagan. And, you know, about 10 years ago, I started incorporating pagan into my daily political analysis. And I got to tell you, John, when I first started doing this for a living, I, I didn't think I'd ever be using terms like that. Now I just jump right to demonic right. every day and we, we skip past pagan. All right. But I think this is an important word for us to understand because I take it as what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is a great meta point that we got to help the audience hone in on. When I, hear, when I hear you invoke that term, what I hear you saying is that today's progressives are really regressives. They are trying to return Western civilization to a pre-Christendom, pre-Judeo-Christian, pre-Bible, under whatever terminology you, you, you come out of tribalistically. But they're trying to return West, the West to an understanding of, that, of the world in a pre-Christian era. Literally, we're talking like Druids. That, that's, kind of, that's literally what we're talking about, okay? That kind of stuff. Um, and, and that's why we are you seeing pa- pagan things, the distinctions that, of the world that Christianity won these arguments in history, and even non-Christians agreed, okay, yeah, it's true, there's only two genders, stuff like that, okay? That these things are now all up for debate, not because these are new arguments, but these are the old ones that we already defeated, we just let them back in. Correct or incorrect? No, I think that's right. The pagan ethos can be summed up in a single line. Everything is true. Uh, Sorry, I messed it up. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. So we're seeing a radical subjectivity creep into our public life and our public debates right now. And it's really, um, you know, for all the invocations of science and skepticism and rationalism and follow the science, that's not really where we're headed as a society, right? We don't really follow the science because we mix in these totally unscientific, totally unreasonable uh, ways of talking and thinking about living my own truth and uh, realizing, my, you know, my, my own inner gender uh, and and justifying, you know, crazy stuff during COVID that was totally disconnected from from any data or any science that was out there. Uh, and so we're seeing these th- this new pagan ethos emerge. And it really is something out of the past. And it's totally the inversion of Western civilization and the Christian worldview that created Western civilization. And that was a worldview that posited like universal moral truths Mm -hmm. that were true at all time, in all places, to all human beings. And it had a very specific idea of what a human being was and what our relationship to God was and what our obligations were to one another and how society should be organized. The pagan ethos suggests a totally different kind of society and Mm -hmm. and way of organizing things. Let's give the audience maybe a practical example to under to fully grasp what you and I are talking about and something that's not too far into the into the past. When we are living under still the passed on traditions and revel and general revelations of Christianity or Western civilization, you can have a culture where a virulent atheist like Ayn Rand can still, even though she's rejecting the larger meta truths of the cosmos, she is still when, when founding her own independent philosophy, she's calling it objectivism and, and is still lining up many of her own ethos alongside of what Christianity happens to think, which is why, a lot of Christians who may not even know Ayn Rand's background read works, you know, like Atlas Shrugged and nodded their head along and said, well, there's a lot of truth there, not understanding that she thought you were basically a fool for believing Jesus rose from the dead. Okay. What you see now, though, 
all right, is now you see a similar virulent atheist in Richard Dawkins, who successfully deconstructed Christianity, is and actually thought that we were going to get Christless Christianity. Like, like he actually he communicated this a few days ago. We played the clip on the show. He really thought we were still going to have Christmas carols and joy in our hearts and a universal moral moral code and 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 you know I I I put my neighbor's you know interest ahead of my own that we were going to have that on our own without as what he called cultural Christianity without actually yeah. the authority of Christ and that happens in a post-Christian pagan era. Ayn Rand lived in maybe the last Christian era of America. Richard Dawkins here is in the first generation of the post-Christian era. And you can see how each of them trying to create an independent framework within the, the Christian moral, the Christian moral one, what the end result is. Is that fair? Yeah, it's totally fair. I really was surprised that Richard Dawkins doesn't understand that you can't have the culture without the cult, right? All of the things, the accoutrements and the benefits and the principles of Western civilization, all of the wonderful things that we enjoy, freedom of speech, government by consent, rule of law, human rights, those things rely for their vitality on a Christian tradition and on a Christian faith that liberalism alone on itself cannot reproduce or mm -hmm. sustain, mm -hmm. right? You have to have the actual cult to get the culture and you have to have actual believing Christians who are practicing their faith in order to have the wonderful cathedrals that Richard Dawkins likes to go to and someone to sing the Christmas carols. He should know in his own country, the cathedrals are being turned into nightclubs or mosques, mosques yeah. or apartments. Yep. So you, you're not going to keep the cathedrals and the Christmas carols without actual people who believe that the cathedrals are for worshiping God and the Christmas carols are for, for worshiping God and, and who actually believe this stuff. Uh, there is no such thing as a cultural Christian, in other words. All right, let's, let's get into real trouble then. Are you down with that for a minute? Okay. Sure. Because you mentioned that, that liberals are learning the hard way you can't have Christless Christianity. I am just as alarmed now at the rise of what I am calling Christless conservatism. That's what we're kind of calling it on this show or yeah. uh, make the trains run on time conservatism. Uh, that if we just meet people's material needs and get rid of all moral ethos whatsoever, we'll win more elections, yada, 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 and be better liked. Yeah. And I, I look at the way some prominent conservatives respond to some of the things recently said by people like Charlie Kirk or Dusty Deaver in Oklahoma, and and you may or may or may, may or may not agree with their particular observations or the extent by which they are, uh, the extents or links they're taking their Christian faith into public policy, but that's not really the arguments I see against their observations. It's just like people are insulted that they would even on the right. There's a growing cadre of people insulted they would even try at all to insert their Christian faith into the moral ethos at all to question whether, you know, giving te our teenage daughter's birth control is a good idea, for example, you know, and 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 I'm I, I just don't believe the godless right has any shot up against the godless left because the godless left is godless in name only. They just have a different religious framework and they're really committed and convicted to, on it. And a godless right, it has no chance up against that. People will go with the, the folks they think have the stronger belief system. That's how I read it, John. What about you? No, I think you're right. The, um, there is really, we shouldn't talk about the godless right as conservatives, right? They're not conservatives. They may be on the right, but they're really a species of liberal um, and, and, and they accept the premise, right, of, of the, the liberal worldview, which is that you know, religion has no place in the public square. We need to not be talking about our religious beliefs. We just need to make their trains run on time. And we, we don't need to have these fights about birth control or about, you know, what is, what is fundamentally, you know, uh, creates human flourishing, right? And, and uh, what society is seen, what is true, good, and beautiful? What is the pursuit of happiness, right? The mm -hmm. founders understood the pursuit of happiness was the pursuit of virtue. That's what was happiness, right? It was freedom to do the right thing and to do what you ought to do. Um, and so it wasn't just sort of a live and let live libertarianism. And I think what we're seeing now is that the future of America, of post-Christian America and the post-Christian West, is not this secular, liberal, uh, tolerant utopia where we have, as you say, Christless Christianity, and we retain all of the benefits of Christian civilization with none of the religion. We're seeing now an absolutely like virulently intolerant left 
where the pagan v- virtues of force and coercion mm. are the rule of the day, mm-hmm. might really does make right. That is true of all pagan societies in the mm-hmm. past. The only thing that ever broke that was paganism's encounter with Christianity. And as Christianity sunsets in the West, you have this paganism that was always there, simmering below the surface. It's coming out in modern forms. And we're starting to see it in our political economy and our political discourse. And I think these these folks that you refer to on the right are, are really, uh, they're, they're not really conservatives. They, they, they accept the premises of the left and they accept the claims of, uh, you know, a secular uh, neutral public spaces that, that have been synonymous with liberalism for, you know, uh, for half a, a century, but are not really true. And they're, they're already outdated. And so I think they're, they're fighting a losing battle there. And, and as you say, people are going to pick the stronger horse. And right now the stronger horse are the left wing pagans. I've got about two minutes here. Let's get to the other part. That's very well said, by the way, John. Thank you. Let's get to the other part of your subhead about what comes next. Because I'm a big believer, revival or bust. We in uh, like great Amer- great awakening levels of revival or this thing's going bust. Now, bust can look a lot of different ways. You know, we might have too many people and too many nuclear weapons, you know, for the Visigoths come over to the wall. Maybe we're just a, a husk of a country like you mentioned England is now. So they're still in America, but it's it's not any of the stuff that it was actually founded on, you know. Um, but yeah. um, what comes next then? If we're in a post-Christian era, then what happens? I think that we're further into a post-Christian era than a lot of us realize. We were all born into a a country and a civilization that was already well into its post-Christian phase. And I think we need to recognize that this isn't something that um, is going to be resolved in a generation. It didn't start a generation ago. And it's going to take our children and our grandchildren and maybe our great-grandchildren to turn this around. And so I think what's coming is that America is not going to decline and fall, right? America is going to become evil and powerful, uh, but we're going to become a pagan nation. And so the things that we have enjoyed, freedom of speech and a neutral public square, you know, uh, you can worship freely. You can say whatever you want about the government. We need to be realistic about the fact that those things are going to come to an end because If we reject Christianity and we reject the Christian view of God and man and society, there's no basis for those things. Hmm. There's no basis. You know, and and the people who are running this country, how much do you think they care about free speech? I think Mm -hmm. we all know Mm -hmm. that they would like you and I to be censored and silenced uh, and for our voices to be snuffed out. How much do you think they care about the freedom of speech and the freedom of of conscience and religion of of, of anti-abortion protesters, Right. I don't think that there's anything that they won't do to silence and stop those people. And so I I think we need to be realistic about the fact that the basis for restraining their hand for the, on on the the part of the state is going away. And, and it it means dark times ahead, but the, the note of hope that we can end on is that, as I said earlier, it was the encounter with Christianity that broke the pagan empires in the past. Mm -hmm. And it will be a smaller and more, and a more faithful Christian church that breaks the, the hold of the new pagan empire that's coming into being right now. That is a good word, brother. This is a very important work. Uh, make sure you pick up this book, Pagan America, The Decline of Christianity in the Dark Age to Come by John Daniel Davidson over at The Federalist. And uh, we definitely got to be doing this more often, John. I mean, we're, we're speaking the same Absolutely. language, brother. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You bet. Looks good there on the uh, Blaze set there yeah. over Pat Gray Studio, too. Um, brought to you. Uh, this is a great segue. It's a good day of segues. Kind of an awkward segue. Lo- me losing my mind about Bruce Jenner. Then my nine-year-old uh, niece came in. <laughs> Okay, so we've had some good smooth segues ever since. Um, You know, one of the things we can do to challenge the paganism of the era is what our colleague uh, Jason Whitlock is doing with his Fearless Army Roll Call. Uh, He's partnering with country music star John Rich for Roll Call 2.0 in Nashville, presented by our good friends over at Preborn. It's coming up on June 1st in Nashville. You can come for the great music, food, and fellowship and be transformed by the biblically inspired messages delivered by Jason and a whole host of uh, great speakers, including North Carolina Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson. So... We'll find out how good of a gubernatorial candidate it is, but no one's doubting that dude can bring some thunder behind a pulpit, right? So um, go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com to reserve your spot. That's fearlessarmyrollcall.com to get your tickets today at fearlessarmyrollcall.com. All right, thoughts on the conversation we just had with John Daniel Davidson. 
just, we're not resigning ourselves. We're accepting a truth. We're not resigning ourselves to the dark days ahead. We're accepting that that is the truth. And it reminds me of, I, I've kept bringing this up, but the, the, the show on Disney Plus, probably Disney Plus's best work on the Star Wars series, which is Andor, particularly one episode, which I have which I have characterized as a sermon, a homily before, and it's it's the episode One Way Out, where the main protagonist of the show, Andor, who's part of the kind of proto-ragtag group of rebels uh, fighting against the evil empire, is sent to a prison. He's caught and he's sent to a prison. And this prison is essentially amongst the inmates is, one, is run by one inmate. I can't remember the character's name, but he's played by Andy Serkis and, and done very well. And this inmate basically keeps the peace among the prisoners. And this inmate played by Andy Serkis is under, under the uh, idea, under the auspice, and under the uh, delusion, really, that he has a compact with the Empire, has a compact with those, with his captors, that if he does his time, if he does his work, if he meets his deadlines for forced labor, he will be free one day. And Andor comes in, Cassian Andor comes in, and he says, basically, no, they were never going to hold up their end of the bargain. The only way you're getting out of here is through here. Mm -hmm. One way out. That's where we are culturally right now. There's the, the only way out is through. There's going to be a lot of people that say, but, 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 but the compact. But, 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 but if I put my chips in the right place here, they're going to leave me alone. No, they're not. They were never going to do that. Amen. Yeah, nailed it. We can't do any better than that, dude. You stuck the landing, brother. Romans 828.